we are ready for our next talk. And this is going to be an exciting one. We're going to talk about some urgent calls to actions on how do we think about the evolution of DAOs, communities, and governance in Web3. And I want to welcome our speaker, Parker, um, to uh, get us started. And uh, appreciate you waiting. Welcome. Hi, um, super happy to be here. Uh, I have something to screen share today. Let's go for um, it. Amazing. Cool. Great. Um, starting off with a quick intro. Um, super happy to be here today. I'm Parker. Um, I'm very involved uh, in the crypto space across a few different contexts. Um, I'm on the founding team of Boys Club, which is a social club community and DAO working to welcome women and non-binary individuals into Web3. You can check us out on Twitter at Boys Club Crypto. Um, I'm also working as an early stage investor um, in crypto startups at FinTech Collective on their DeFi fund, um, and specifically work there with our founders one-on-one um, -on -one to help them build, scale, and design their communities. So everything from um, pre-launch to um, even like communities and protocols later on, the AppDAO is helping them rethink their governance structures, uh, et cetera. Um, so today, what am I going to be talking about? I have a lot of thoughts um, and feelings and ideas around how we can be doing better um, in sort of the frameworks and assumptions that we um, are approaching DAO's community and governance around. Um, so this is going to be pretty high level. Um, I'm aware that we only have um, about 30 minutes here. Um, I don't know if we have a timer, but um, for the mods, definitely let me know. Um, when we get to like 10 minutes, if, that, if that's okay with you. Um, to kick things off, um, I want to talk about DAOs. Great, thanks. Um, so DAOs have gotten huge, right? Like we're seeing new DAOs spawn up every day. Um, we're seeing web two companies want to make DAOs. At least I'm seeing this in, in my work as a VC also. Um, you know, a lot of like founders will will pitch their startup, will pitch their product, um, and mention um, that they're also creating a DAO. Um, this to me is sometimes like a little bit of a, a jarring statement because DAOs are such a huge project, right? Like they're almost like starting a second um, startup, I think, if you're doing it right. Um, and so DAOs as a concept have gotten huge, even though they're so new, but they're still failing massively in several ways, right? They're failing to get off the ground. Um, we're seeing classic coordination failures, um, low participation, um, low engagement. Um, and even when success is found, um, DAOs are imploding, right? Um, you know, we could point to uh, some of MakerDAO's recent struggles um, with governance. I don't think Maker is a failure, but they're facing struggles. So big established DAOs that are sort of the name of the game even are um, encountering like a lot of, a lot of issues. Um, and so where are we really going wrong here? I think there's a few things that I'd like to draw our attention to here today. Um, I think a lot of, uh, a, a lot of DAO building or sort of thinking around DAO building that I'm seeing today focuses on outcome um, rather than need or rather than demand. Um, so we're seeing a lot of people um, that want to spin up DAOs, that have ideas for DAOs, um, but don't have the actual community or participants um, to start with. Um, we're also seeing um, a lack of intrinsically motivated participants within DAOs, right? So we're seeing a lot of DAOs that have um, a lot of members, a lot of participants, um, but not a lot of participation and not a lot of engagement, especially long term. Um, and then we're seeing a lot of uh, out of the box comp composition, right? So um, lots of DAO tooling startups um, that are just like easily spin up your own DAOs. Um, no hit on that, but I think there is um, a little bit of lack of like nuance um, in some of the in some of the DAOs that are being created, right? So not fully thinking through um, all of the design pieces um, that that make up a DAO and that will will. Uh, greatly affect how the DAO operates in the future, um, or maybe not even knowing what those pieces are really um, that that need um, that need a lot of thoughtful consideration. Um, so, what are some things that we could do, or some frameworks we could use to try to approach um, some of these issues that I just mentioned? 
Um, I think first, um, validating demand, right? Startup soda one, product one one, same for DAOs, same for community building. Um, I'm, I'm a firm believer that community should come before the DAO. Um, once again, we're seeing a lot of people who want to create DAOs um, and are looking to find the community to fit into the DAO after. I don't think that works. Um, I think you need a community that um, that a DAO will only only bring value to, right? So um, another important thing here, right, would be asking, why are we even creating a DAO? Um, do we need a DAO for this use case or for this community? Um, or is the motivation to create one maybe um, motivated by um, a bid for relevancy, right? Trying to stay relevant or um, trying to follow the buzz. Um, this is a hard question to answer. And it takes a lot of, I don't think you can even answer it like right away. Like it takes a lot of thoughtful consideration, writing, um, talking to other people to really understand, like, why do we need a DAO? Why are we doing this? Um, for Boys Club, um, we're creating a DAO uh, to enhance what's already working really well within Boys Club, right? Um, which is a lot of participation, a lot of different ideas, a lot of um, different segments and pockets of our community that want to spin up different things. So the DAO structure, um, which we're still iterating on, we're still taking very very slowly. Um, the DAO structure, though, allows us to um, super efficiently, um, or at least more efficiently than before, uh, streamline um, ideas from the idea stage into ac actual execution. Um, and allows us to make sure that um, there is there's not as much uh, imbalance of power or say um, in the dictation of where the community goes in the future. Optimizing for sustainability over speed would be a second one. Again, I think we're seeing a lot of out of the box solutions, um, people that promise, you know, use this toolkit, spin up your DAO in a few days, in a week, we'll get everything set up. Um, I think that DAO should take a very slow approach. Um, I'm very bullish on experimentation and iteration and also research. Um, so when uh, Boys Club was founded, um, I immediately knew like the DAO aspect is what I wanted to kind of focus on. Um, and it's been like eight or nine months since then, the DAO is not done. Um, and I was expecting this to be maybe like a three to four month process. Um, but after three or four months, I was not even done with the research phase of like the process of DAO building. Um, and this is because I wanted to really, you know, there's so much information about DAOs. There's so many different ways to create them. We do, also don't have a current body of literature, um, formalized body of literature around DAOs and DAO building. Um, so there's a lot of like, uh, like personal initiative research that you have to do. Um, and I think like sustainability is really important, right? So when you think about your community um, and how to build a DAO that's sustainable for them, um, you, I think it's best to really take it slow, right? Test and iterate these processes before you decide to implement them. Um, and test and, and iterate many different processes before you decide to iterate, uh, to implement them. Um, <clears throat> with this comes like a willingness to look beyond traditional methods. Um, out of the box solutions and maybe people who um, want you to build your DAO with them in a week um, might suggest the most traditional or like widely accepted methods um, for um, participation, uh, participation streams or governance design um, for token uh, model or tokenomic model. Um, I strongly believe that like every DAO is different and needs a different thing. Just like every person has different preferences in um, personal taste, personal style, in um, what works best for them and what's best for them in health and in, and in their diet and in their workout routine. Um, DAOs are similarly different and communities are similarly different and need different things. Um, so yeah, like I sort of think about DAO building in a very like nerdy way, like almost kind of like a science experiment. Like there's all these different variables um, and all these different things that have to fit together and factors that influence each other um, to uh, to drive the outcome of the of the experiment. Um, and there's many different like things that you have to like sort of fine tune within that experiment um, to make it right. Um, Moving on to DAO governance, um, lots of thoughts here. I'm gonna give a very high level overview. Um, 
So I think like the current mental model of governance in DAOs generally in the space today um, is token or coin voting. So this would be like um, when I buy a token, um, for example, I have governance rights. This is how it works in um, DAOs like Maker, other DAOs where um, there's no kind of opt-in to governance. It's just like when you have a token, you are automatically um, eligible to participate. Um, I think like we're also seeing a lot of proven failures with this system though, right? So like even Vitalik like recently published um, a piece against uh, token voting and sort of providing some alternative ideas around it, but it's still um, the most widely accepted and thought of um, governance mechanism in this space today, at least as I see it. Um, so I'm seeing recently like a lot of rejection of DAOs and a lot of rejection of um, DAO governance. You know, a lot of people on crypto Twitter are saying DAOs don't work, DAOs don't work as a business model, they're a failure, it's proven. And I'm like, no guys, like token voting is um, maybe not a proven failure, but not working, right? And that's the thing, that's the similarity across these DAOs that you're pointing to as examples, right? Um, so I think we have an urgent call to action to explore other kinds of um, governance mechanisms and you know, really focus uh, more resources on um, experimentation, research, um, and just like iteration on alternative and emergent forms of governance. Um, what I'm really excited about is uh, conviction voting, which is sort of a mechanism of staking your vote um, at gaining more uh, gaining more power over time or weight over time. Um, and, you know, I think we need um, governance mechanisms that really capture more of the dynamic nature of humans. <laughs> so like a snapshot voting uh, proposal works, right? But um, informa new information is revealed over time. 10 minutes, okay, thank you. New information is revealed over time, human change over time, their opinion change over time. Um, so that should be able, in my opinion, to be reflected within governance decisions. Um, and I'm like, where's the disconnect, right? Like there's actually a lot of really great um, peer reviewed research, academic research on emergent forms of governance and on some of the um, ways in which um, current mechanisms of governance uh, are failing. Um, but these don't have widespread attention in crypto. Um, so there is this disconnect. And I'm wondering, like, how can we work um, to begin to not only continue exploring alternate um, mechanisms of governance, um, but also like begin to change and shift the mental models um, of governance um, within the crypto community to um, see governance as this plethora of options and also as this completely um, unexplored and open design space that still exists rather than um, accepting governance and DAO governance as um, something that's failing currently. Um, so I could get into community. It's something I talk about a lot. I have lots of thoughts here as well, but um, I guess like, I don't know if the chat is open. I do wanna pause and like open to any questions uh, so far. Um, is that possible? Oh, we'll uh, we'll source in anything that comes in from uh, from the attendees. But um, in the meantime, cool. I can kind of continue uh, with the rest of the slides. Awesome, great um, community, like a very nebulous word, um, and one that's thrown around a lot. So, um, community is not fluff. Let's like let's get this straight. Community is crucial, especially in crypto, right? Um, in a bear market, in tough times, um, what is holding your protocol up, right? If you have a token, um, you need that price up, right? And so like your community is going to be the one powering that. But I think community goes way beyond just financial incentive as well. Like um, there's a lot of big green energy entering the crypto. Uh, crypto community space. And I think we're really beginning to see um, how sticky community is. And like community, if done right, can be a, an absolute leverage um, for every aspect of your business and every aspect of what you're building, right? These are your evangelists. These are, these are owners. These are people that will be contributing in the future and providing you feedback. Um, but I think too many in the space currently 
um, mistake community for marketing. And I think sometimes community is marketing and that's great. Um, and there is some crossover, right? Um, but it's not always marketing. And I think it's a fatal flaw to, to view community as marketing. Um, here's why. I also think it's kind of cringe. Here's why. Um, marketing is all about uh, capturing users, right? And getting your brand out there. And like community inherently, um, if it's successful, will work as a marketing engine. Um, but if you treat community like marketing, when you're first trying to think about how to build it and how to sustain it, um, it's never going to work because um, you're going to need to see community as an ecosystem, right? It's, it's ever evolving um, and it's ground up. Um, so you need like a sustainable foundation um, in order to build a community that in turn can be a marketing engine for you. Um, and I think there's like a a several step process here, which I'll just briefly sort of walk through and how I think about community building um, both at Boys Club and um, when I'm working with um, some of my portfolio companies at FinTech Collective. So I think the first step is defining what you are, like what is your community about? And also like, what is it not about? Um, what do you stand for? What do you not stand for? And I think getting as niche as possible here is really helpful. Um, once you understand what you're all about, what your community is all about, um, and what you want people to get from it and take away from it and learn from it, um, you need to attract those members. Um, so like top of funnel awareness, right? Um, and once you have sort of like had those first community members trickle in, um, you wanna activate them. Sorry, this should say activate. Um, so start finding ways to get them comfortable, get them involved, have them enjoy themselves, um, make sure they have all the resources they need to succeed and be able to navigate the community and all the things that it provides. Um, and then you'll start to see people who like actively want to get more involved. Um, maybe they'll pitch in with ideas. Maybe they'll have feedback. Um, maybe they'll come to you one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and you want to like harness that power because that is like magical energy. And there's like a special window of time that you need to capture that energy within. So then involving them, right? giving them more responsibility, maybe Azure community skills. Um, they can take notes on community calls. They can um, jump in um, to moderate, um, finding ways to, to give them more responsibility. And finally, um, giving them responsibility and opportunity um, for ownership. Um, so enabling ownership. Um, and I think like, I guess to close out this sort of high level segment here, um, a lot of uh, companies that I work with, um, when we start working together, immediately say like, we want to optimize for ownership and building our community. Um, but I think one thing that's too often overlooked is like all of the steps um, that it takes to set up ownership. And it's almost like that meme of like the guy with the domino and like the many dominoes. Um, like you need to first um, know what your community is about, then attract those members, then activate them, then involve them um, to enable um, sustainable ownership in my experience at the minute. Um, so yeah, I think that's like pretty much it for me. Um, but any, if, if there are any questions, happy to answer them. Um, I can go deeper into any of these subjects. Um, but yeah, I'm at Parker, J-A-Y-P on Twitter. If you want to chat, follow me, DM me, I'm around. Um, yeah, and super happy to, to be awesome. here. So thank you so much guys for having me. Thanks, Parker. No, that was uh, that was very insightful and uh, and also uh, a little bit spicy. I think uh, it's just some uh, some good uh, direct and actionable things uh, that we can talk about. Uh, maybe my kind of first question would be, um, I, I, I think, um, or rather, how do you differentiate between like knowing what to do and sort of how do we get there? Um, uh, you kind of uh, talked about a lot of things that you've seen firsthand not work um, as as well as uh, either people think or or you uh, yourself uh, thought they would. Uh, is is this largely a mindset thing? Is this largely a tooling issue? Is this largely something that we have to kind of instill at the beginning? Like at what point of the process of a lifetime of a member joining a community do these things need to be addressed? And, and sort of how would you kind of think about um, backtracking and implementing where these things should be uh, actually put in? Yeah, that's a great question. So obviously I take a very method methodological approach to community building. And I I don't think that's like bad. And I think like sometimes people are a little bit shy to take like kind of a almost like strategic approach. But I do think, you know, there are like ways to activate a community and it's not necessarily like extractive. Um, I think just like 
keeping these things in mind throughout the process. I think it is sort of a framework and I wouldn't say mindset, but more of a framework um, that that can be reevaluated over time. So like at any point in the process, right? Even if you already have a community and you've had one for two years and never even thought about this, you can still sort of walk through this and think through this and um, look for like the, the sort of user journey or pipeline within your community. Um, and I don't think it's a one size fits all approach. Like the way that, um, you know, certain communities might uh, work to attract their members or like define what they're about might be different from others and that's okay but it's sort of like the general idea and just like hitting those steps making sure they're accounted for um, that I think is important does that answer your question I know it definitely does and and maybe um, one kind of other uh, follow-up would be uh, do you think there are not do you think, I guess, what are some examples that others should uh, shamelessly steal from? Like, who, who do you have, have you seen has done a really good job at, at implementing some of the changes that you proposed, uh, in addition to, uh, obviously, kind of uh, a view? But uh, what are some of, like, the nice ways to kind of understand if this is working in practice and, and kind of contrasting with the alternatives? Sure, that's a great question. I think there are a lot of um, great communities out there that are each, you know, doing uh, like have strengths in different ways. I don't think there's anyone that's nailed this down perfectly. And that also is just inherent to the fact that communities are ever changing and their their needs are ever changing. Um, I I really admire, um, you know, some of the, the work actually done by um, a woman, not in the Web3, not in the Web3 space, um, but named Priyanka Parker. So I read, I read her book, The Art of Gathering, which actually focuses on like in real life events and community building in real life. Um, and I, I love the way that she um, broke down almost like the art of the literally the art of gathering and and bringing people together um, in a very thoughtful and strategic way and like she almost the way that I talked about Dow building community building as an experiment like I saw her view gathering as an experiment so she like lays out like all of these different um almost like experiments that she's done about um you know the the amount of people that you bring in and what kind of atmosphere that creates um intention setting explicitly before the event um how to make people feel comfortable like like methodologies literally um that she is that she is like refined and composed and put together in different ways um so like that that thinking i really love um and yeah like i mean there again like so many great communities out there um mochi mochi dot game has done a great job of world building i think that's also that's something i should have put in this presentation but world building is like an essential aspect of community in my mind and um, but she has done like a beautiful, like illustrative magical job of that. Um, govern, the govern community is great. Um, Aaron and Stefan are great. They're constantly iterating, like we're working with them and they're constantly coming to us with feedback questions. Like um, I love like the thoughtful and like long-term approach that they take. Um, yeah, so many communities that I could, I could gush about, but um, yeah. Right. Uh, we have another question from the audience, uh, which is, uh, what are your thoughts on uh, proven corporate structure? And kind of do you think if somebody found a way to easily merge those kind of proven ways to uh, to behave or operate at scale uh, with kind of DAF formations, like would that actually make things easier? Or do you kind of, you know, we reject some of those existing things? That's a great question. Um, okay, so I guess to answer that, I'll say, first of all, um, I'm taking my own opinion here with a grain of salt. Um, there's actually a book that I'm that I just ordered on Amazon to read about this, um, and it goes over this uh, like thing called like the teal structure um, that I read about uh, in Rook Protocols. Um, let's see if I can put this in the chat. I really loved um, the way that I was reading this, and I loved the way that they were thinking about. Uh, I just put it in the chat, um, community building. So like they they think about it as almost very similar to Orca protocol, love Orca, love the Orca community as, by the way, as well, um, but like modular and um, delegated decision-making, but they borrow, at least within Rook protocols documentation, this corporate kind of uh, method of like the teal 
structure. I, I, I need to read more about it, which is why I ordered the book that they cited it from. But um, I think it could work. I mean, it sounds, it actually, when I read it, I was like, this sounds a lot like what we're doing in Boys Club. But I didn't even know that this existed, right? Um, so I don't know, it could work. Um, I think like, like there are proven things that work in corporate structures. Um, I personally have been more involved in like the startup kind of world. So I, I don't really come from that experience, but um, I, yeah, I mean, why not, I guess. But again, I think every, every DAO in community is different. So like, I don't think a corporate structure would be the best for everyone. Absolutely. Um, and uh, our last question, which uh, interestingly comes from our next speaker, um, and that is, uh, do you think tokens help uh, with community building? No, I don't. <laughs> and I think it's really concerning um, when people think that it does. So let me just quickly explain my thinking here. Um, I think it's a fatal flaw to to use a community. Sorry, I think it's a fatal flaw to use a token as a way to try to bol to bolster either marketing, um, brand awareness, relevancy, um, brand exposure, or community building and like community activity. Um, I am of the personal belief, not reflective of my organization with the Boys Club or like my firm, but of my personal belief that you should wait as long as you can to launch a token. Um, I think like finding product market fit, really hard. Building a successful, sustainable, active community, really hard. Um, launching a token, really hard. And that should come after you've found product market fit and after you have a community. And like, that's because the token relies on those other things as well. So like to set the token up for success, like you need to have the most solid foundation possible. Um, and I think we've seen like across the board also, like there's examples of this, right? Like communities and projects and, and protocols and companies that launch a token, like when they're first starting out or launch a token to help the product um, are usually like literally just go on CoinMarketCap and like look through that, you know? Um, so no, I don't think, I don't think tokens help community building, but I do think like if there is a successful, sustainable, strong community and a token is launched, those should work to reinforce each other as a flywheel. So like they can help each other, but from like- Not as zero, an initial incentive, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, well, um, thank you so much for uh, that amazing talk and, and going into all those questions. Um, really appreciate taking the time. And uh, with that, we are ready for our next speaker. Thank you guys so much. Um, have a great day. You too.